Let me start with this one. Uh, if it said manager, I think we know your answer, John. It, the question is, who was the best coach you played under and why? Well, the best manager was Mourinho, but best coach as well. He'd done everything. I don't know what previous managers for, for yourself were like, but he was, he was the first one who came in and revolutionised it at, at Chelsea. He'd be the first one in, and no lie, 8 o'clock, he'd be the one setting the cones out. And you come in as a group of players, and he was out there pouring the rain, getting his session organised, and we literally went from like four grids of the pitch, from that to that. But in between that, there was drinks. So there weren't no, this session here, go over there for a drink. It was lads were training for an hour. That's it, you go from there to there to there to there. He brought uh, three young kids in, ball boys. Every time the ball went out of play, we had a ball back in instantly. And if that was a bad pass or a bad roll from one of his staff, I'm not like, he would stop the session and go absolutely berserk at his members of staff. And to a point, pretty embarrassing for them. But his standards were so high and he demanded from everyone you know, from the players, his staff, from people inside the, you know, the, the medical team, everyone at the football club. So you'd never seen that level of professionalism before? Not, not like that, no. He was, he was on everything. He knew, you know, when we travelled, why we travelled two days earlier, why we stayed overnight, the best hotels. He was on everything. Other, just his, his intensity to everything and attention to detail was, was incredible. Did he change the way that you thought about football? Yeah, 100%. When he first came in, the first session, the lads walked in, we was like, wow, that's a, that's a proper session, that. Can you remember and, the specifics of that? <laughs> well, just the flow. It was pre-season. And the first thing he said to the players was, right, balls. Balls day one. And balls for, of our generation, of going, you got footballs out day one of pre-season, was probably unheard of. He was like, his fitness coach was, you never see a pianist run around the piano, you see a pianist work on the piano and improve. And from day one we had the balls and mentally it was like, wow. But I tell you what, we probably covered more distance with the ball than we would have done running around the pitch. But mentally and psychologically, he had us. We was, we was brought into whatever he, he was going to deliver that day. How, how did that change when he came back, that second spell? He was the same, exactly the same. Now people have said about when he came back, he, was, he wasn't. The intensity, him taking every session, him being there, you know, just having his presence, uh, his presence. He never, on, on the second time round, he never done every, took every session himself, but his presence was there. And you felt it as a player. He had his eyes on everyone. If someone was messing about in the warm-up or kicking a ball when he's speaking, it was like, when I speak, the ball stays still, you listen to me. You know, he, he was the boss. From the outside, at times, certainly in that second spell, and, th and there were rumours about it not ending well in the first spell between, between you and he, relationship-wise, but from the outside, John, in that second spell, it looked like it was a complicated relationship. He very publicly substituted you at Manchester City at half-time, when it perhaps wasn't necessary to do that. Well, Tell us from your point of view. Well, I think the big managers, and when I look in world football, he's probably the biggest, and the big managers are never afraid to make big decisions. Now, he obviously thought that was right, but even as a player, as his captain, played every minute of every game the season before, I was like, he's in charge, that's it. I went in the following day, we didn't even talk about it. And I just showed him that, you know, I'm here if you need me, that was it. There was no discussion, no need for him to pull me, if that was his faults. And the mentality, I would literally, probably for the football club, but for him, I would, I would give everything, I would, I would leave that pitch you know, in a coffin for him. It was in every, every player that he had felt the exact same way. And, and does that relationship continue? Is it, is it still the same now Yeah, still in great contact. Even when I joined Aston Villa, he was the first one to text me, congratulate me, and said he'd be watching the games, he'll be a, a Villa fan. And listen, that's what he does. When, uh, when Rafa was at Chelsea, he didn't play me. Then Mourinho took over again. He was the one on the phone to me in the summer going, JT, I know you as an individual, I know you as a player. We start from scratch, come back, you're my main man, you're my captain, you're going to play next year. Work hard in the summer. And I remember being out for dinner with my wife and my kids. I had a glass of wine. I got off the phone to him and was like, that's it, no more wine, that's it, I'm training two, three times a day. And that's the way he pressed people's buttons. He knew how to press mine, he knew how to press Lamps's and get the best and suck every last bit out of everyone. Did Rafa text you? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> what about Carlo Ancelotti? How, how different was he? He was, um, he was very good. Man management, superb. Tactically and the things that he brought to, to us as a football team, because at the time there was, you know, Man United had improved 
um, Liverpool, you know, everyone was getting better. So tactically, we was a lot better. And I think you see how organised we was when we won the league under him and done the double. We was a much better and more organised team under him. But his man management skills are excellent and just a lovely guy. Everyone says that about him. Uh, mm. uh, I'm not sure that people would say that. I don't know. I don't know, Jose. People would say the same about him. But when you have someone as a manager that you really like, does that change the dynamic? No, not really, because there's liking. I think when you're getting results as well, you can like or dislike the way they're, they're doing things. Or, but when results are coming the weekend and you're churning out results, you can't help but love what the manager's doing. And the way he treats people as well, it's not just... You know, Mourinho had it so good. He was... You know, you'd be at home, you'd be out injured, he'd sling you a text, kind of need you back, you know, or this game's coming up, rest, go away for three or four days, I need you back for this game. You're important to it. But he'd done it not only with me as captain, but four or five of the more experienced players. And then we managed that dressing room for him. We had big characters at the time, so he'd done his bit, but made us feel like we was the, the powerhouse in that dressing room. In terms of that dressing room, we've heard this before about the, the powerhouse of the Chelsea dressing room and, and you being at the, the centre of that and, and perhaps having a, a line of communication that goes above the manager. W was that the case? No, never been the case at Chelsea. Um, you know, obviously you've got senior players that myself, Frank, Didier, Ivanovic, Peter Cech that have been there a long time and, you know, would, would speak to the club or the owner would speak about certain individual players like Stevie, you want to sign Stevie. You know, you, you, you ask get... about me? No, not you, mate. No. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> so you would, go, you would go and say no, you should be signing these players? No, we wouldn't go. We would be asked the question, what's he like as a character? What's he like as a player to play and train with? That kind of thing. But when you kind of hear stories about players going to the board and stuff, I, I don't think that happens, you know. I, I think for the benefit of the football club, you know, that's why the owner's in charge. He puts people in charge to make them decisions for him. It's do, not down to the players. Do you think managers sometimes relied on you to control that dressing room environment? Well, I think because I was captain, people kind of look at me as, as being that one person. I was very lucky that I had Lamps, Didier, Peter Cech, Ash, Ivanovic, some big characters, Balak, when he arrived as well. We had such a good group that any younger player turning up late, if I'm not in the dressing room, Didier would be on them. If something else happened on the pitch, Two or three of us would be there, nip it in the bud instantly. And I think that, that's where football's changed slightly these days, where it's a little bit more relaxed. I think people are a little bit scared to kind of say stuff to each other, whereas back in the day, you'd come in at half-time and you'd, you'd be squaring up to people and, you know, you'd be at it. But as soon as that 90 minutes is, is finished, that'll be the end of it. Now it's kind of... It drags on for a few days and... Presumably you'd be the same at Liverpool. You and, and Steve would be running that, that dressing room for a lot of years. Yeah. Uh, well, it depends on how you mean like running the dressing room. I mean, you actually, as you've mentioned there, uh, the big characters in that. What, I think does it, what does it mean? Is it setting the standards? Or? I think so. I think it's more of an example thing. I don't think. I mean, I was very, very demanding of my own players on the pitch in training every day. I'm sure if you, if you spoke to them or whatever, they'd say, oh, he was a moaner, he was this, he was that. I like to think they thought it was okay off the you pitch. You were definitely a moaner. I, I was. Uh, I've, I've never hid that fact. I always say, I always say this. People say, who do you keep in touch with now when you're finished? No one. No one. Not really. I speak to Stevie now and again. He's at the academy, the old text of the old player. You're not a major. They're not your mates, they're your teammates. And you've got to remember that. You, what you're saying there about something fest for three or four days. You're there to win. You're there to. Uh, I'm, you're from a different country, a different part of the, England, Europe, the South America. These players are my dressing room. They're not my friends. They're not, I'm not going to be keep in touch when you leave. We're here to win for Liverpool today, next week, win trophies. We'll get together in 20 years' time. We'll have a big celebration of what we've done. Fantastic. And I'll see you again in another 20 years. <laughs> you know, that's what you're there for. And I think, as you said there now, people are scared. You don't have them captains, them leaders who sort of demand from each other because I think a lot of the times there's characters there. You, it's difficult for managers, isn't it, as well, also. You've, it's more a case of keeping people on side, keeping people happy, rather than actually telling people straight. Now, I think that may be a problem if, if I went into management. I don't know if I'd be able to change. Would you be able to change if you went into management the way your captain decide, speaking to players, square, you tell them to square it up? It, is that a problem going forward for you, going into coach? I think it'd be a problem for me. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a, that's a boil over of us doing our YTS, cleaning boots, cleaning showers, I think the basics and the principles of, you know, a, a full-time professional throwing his keys at you, telling him to wash your car. Them kind of things coming back and they've poured more mud over it, so you have to go and wash it again. It's them things, though, as a kid, that 
I look back for, uh, at them two years and go, wow, that's the best learning curve I've ever had in football. And without that, which I think the, the kids miss out on today, OK, they're getting more, more game time and more training time, that kind of thing. But I do think there's a balance of they miss out completely on that. But you were captain at, at such a young age, mm. 21, in a dressing room full of stars from, from right across the world. Were you always the leader, you know, even in school teams growing up? Yeah, pretty much. Um, was captain of kind of school, district, Essex, that kind of thing. And Why it's something, was that, do you think? I just think it's the way I demanded from myself and, and other players and done it inst instinctively, didn't do it I want to be this captain. I don't think you can educate or teach someone to be a captain or be a leader. You know, I think the, the word leader is a little bit, I don't know, maybe not right, but just setting the, the right examples. And, and like I said, the, the names I mentioned, myself, Lamps, Didier, Ash, Peter Cech, you know, Ivanovic, every single day they was at 100%. Nothing else was accepted of, of themselves. So their standards are there. When new players arrive at the club, they have to follow. And, you know, that just happens year after year after year. As long as you've got a good core, they're going to follow suit. And if not, they fall by the wayside. Uh, let's settle this tonight. Gerard, Scholes or Lampard? I'm going to say Lamps and I. But I do think, naturally, Scholes was unbelievable, wasn't he? Yeah. At England. He, he done things that I've not seen many players do. He was, he was incredible, but... I would still say Lamps. Having seen Lamps, listen, you would probably say Stevie. Having seen Lamps train and what he could do was unbelievable. I, I want to take another question on, on Twitter at this point, um, which we, we may. Haven't got the strikers? Which might, well, this, this takes us to that, I, I'm guessing, uh, hopefully, John, one player that you were frightened of. Henri. <laughs> you would know, mate. He was so oh, quick. Honestly, I'm still terrified of him now. <laughs> I've got that clip in a minute coming up. Of, <laughs> no, oh, would he run past me? I wouldn't do that to you, mate. <laughs> but he was, he was the best by far, and he had everything. His movement, he was like the silent assassin, wasn't he? He could score with his head, go short, go in behind, right and left foot. He was incredible. But literally, the night before games, he would be the one player in my career that I thought, going to be a tough day tomorrow. And you'd wake up. No one had that effect on me at all, but him. You're the same. Yeah, you, you would you would be thinking about him in, in a big game. I mean, the, you played left centre back. You were okay. He was on the other side. <laughs> the worst position to play against Thierry Henry was right back, not centre back, because he'd end up. So he'd always be running to that left channel. He'd have actually called Bomb. He'd have Perez. That, I, I, I think if you ask me, what was the most difficult? Not just for me, for anyone, any player. What you wouldn't want to go back to was being a right full back against that Arsenal team of sort of 2002 to 2004. I mean, it, the movement, the pace, the, just things would be happening that quickly. You couldn't react to the first <laughs> thing. So you think, oh, I'll do that. And it's already gone there and mm. people are moving. It was just, I mean, they were a great side. And, and probably, I say underachieved because, you know, they, they won leagues, they won the Invincibles. But they, that team should look back and think, why did we not win a Champions League? They, they, they should have won a Champions League in terms of how good that team was. This one's really interesting. And uh, it brings us up to the present day. Whose elevation to the top level has surprised you most out of Kevin De Bruyne, Lukaku and Salah, who, as our questioner says, all struggle to make an impact at Chelsea? Well, like I said before, they all showed glimpses of being very good to the heights of what they are today. Probably, probably not. So I'd have to, I would have to say Kevin De Bruyne, to be honest. Like I said, he was, he was a young boy, didn't really get his chance at Chelsea. Like I said, you can't judge him on four or five games playing here and there. And I say, what he's doing today in the Premier League, if he consistently does this for the next four or five years, he could be up there with the greats, couldn't he? Yes, I, I certainly think so. I think we're looking at a Premier League great. I think we'll be seeing at the end of his career. I mean, I was looking at him the other day. I mean, his performance the other day was just out, out. I mean, I was looking at him thinking, who's he like? I was actually thinking Glenn Hoddle. Mm. You know, what he can do off his left foot, what he can do off his right foot. So it's like Glenn Hoddle with legs who can run and still make challenges. I think we're looking at a, a Premier League all-time great here by the time he's finished, really. But you talk about those players not getting a chance. Is that a problem for Chelsea? Is that something you've got to look back on and think, hang on, how are we actually running this club? Should we be giving players a chance? Because we're talking about, well, certainly De Bruyne and Salah are probably the two best players in the Premier League this season, you'd say right now. Lukaku, you know, big centre-forward scoring goals. Is that not a regret that the club sort of didn't give these people a chance? <sighs> not really, because at the time they didn't make our team stronger. you got, you got to, you know, let's not forget we were one of the best teams probably the Premier League's ever seen in them early days when they arrived. So they was coming into a on the best sides, 
which is even more difficult. When they come in, can they make a big enough impact to sustain and keep their place? No, it's very difficult to do. And that's where I think, you know, even at Chelsea, look at Christensen, he's come in, he's done great, keeps his place. David Luiz is now out, you know, and fighting for his place. When you're a younger player like Loftus-Cheek coming in, can you set the world alight in, in a cup game or whatever game you've been given, the last group game of the, of the Champions League when you've qualified, whatever that may be? I don't think that's enough for these boys to go, that's enough, enough game time to show that I'm a Chelsea player. And I think, unfortunately, he then has to go away to a Crystal Palace. For me, he's good enough to come back at Chelsea. But sometimes you need to go away. i done it when I was younger. I went away and got a bit of game time grew up a little bit, a bit more experience and come back a better player. And unfortunately, you have to do that at the top clubs.